Thank you so much for being here for our rich workshop we have planned that's titled What's Motivation Got to Do With It? Using Teen Intervene as a Tool for Tobacco Use, Vaping, and Substance Use Cessation. My name is Amy Blackshaw. I'm from the California School-Based Health Alliance, where I am the Behavioral Health Project Director. We're so happy that you're joining us for this conversation today. Um, as we get started, just a few notes. We, um, if you are dialing in and need to support with the audio, we're gonna put in the chat, uh, the call-in number. We are recording this webinar and we will be sending out in, um, our slide deck, et cetera, after we are finished today. So California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit organization that supports school health. And this is our mission here. We are here to advance uh, school-based health in um, California schools. And we do this in a, a lot of different ways. We convene trainings and webinars like this one. We identify experts in the field who are doing school health work and sharing best practices. We host an annual conference and we offer lots of written tools and guides to support capacity building to bring more school um, school health into schools. And we support the growth and expansion of school-based health and wellness centers throughout California. Um, while most, we have lots and lots of information and trainings that are all free and available to you through our website, we do encourage folks to become members of our organization so that you can take advantage of additional benefits, such as conference registration discounts and individualized um, technical assistance to help your organization or school or district enhance your school-based health work. Um, and we do have an upcoming webinar we wanted to plug next week, which is really centering our young people. It's called Youth Making an Impact, Elevating the Brilliance of Youth-Led Peer Engagement Programs. So we'll be hearing directly from young people in schools who are running um, different programs to support their peers. We'll drop that link in the chat. Oh, it's already there. Um, and so to introduce our fantastic panel of speakers we have today, I'm just gonna share a small nugget of their backgrounds um, so that we have more time to hear directly from them. But briefly, our first speaker is Ken Winters. He's a senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute and a consultant to the Center for Native Behavioral Health at the University of Iowa. He previously was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota, where he founded and directed the Center for Adolescent Substance Abuse Research for 25 years. So he's an expert in the area of adolescent drug abuse and led the team that developed and field tested Teen Intervene, which we'll be diving into shortly. Next is Jessica Dyer. She worked as a clinician and clinical supervisor in school-based health centers for the Native American Health Center. She has also worked for the Karuk tribe in Northern California, as well as here at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, she currently runs a private practice and works as a consultant for the Native American Health Center school-based program. And finally, my colleague, Marina Quintanilla, who is the advocacy manager at the California School-Based Health Alliance. She leads the implementation of activity in schools and school-based health centers that really address youth advocacy and engagement substance use prevention and non-punitive approaches to, subs to student substance use. She works with our partners to build grassroots advocacy skills and capacity building. And prior to joining CSHA, she managed adolescent health, reproductive health programs in LA um, to improve sexual and reproductive health outcomes through work directly with and for young people. So with that, I'm going to just quickly review our learning objectives for today, which are to, you know, that you come away from this time um, able to identify the key components of Teen Intervene, the brief intervention model, um, identifying some of the best practices and lessons learned um, for Teen Intervene implementation, and to learn strategies to integrate non-punitive approaches 
to address student tobacco, vaping, alcohol, and other drug use on campus. So with that, I'm just going to pass it along to Ken to get us started. Thank you so much, Ken. Amy, thank you. Hello, everyone. Glad to uh, have this opportunity. I appreciate the wonderful organization of this by Amy and her staff. So uh, for the next oh, 35, 40 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of Teen Intervene, sort of the 10,000 feet view of it, uh, walk you through um, its uh, premise, the features to it, show you a few um, uh, exercises, a little bit about um, how to implement it. Um, so it's more didactic and kind of the, uh, the information portion of today's uh, webinar. And then following, Jessica and Marina will talk more about uh, implementation issues. There's my email um, near the bottom. And so feel free to email me if you have follow-up questions. And you will get this slide deck. So you'll be able to um, refer to it um, as a resource. Um, so Teen Intervene um, is basically one of, of, of many options you can use to apply um, a, a screening brief intervention referral to treatment model. Um, there's the brief conversation way to the far left, which can be about 10 minutes, um, where you probably just have time to uh, engage the young person in um, what are their thoughts about their substance use and might they think about some change. There's something uh, referred to as the brief negotiated interview. That's often a one hour type session where you get into pros and cons, triggers and cravings, and then expanded discussion on goals. And Teen Intervene has got um, multiple sessions, I'll show you in a minute. So it uh, expands um, the idea of a, of a brief intervention. It's almost closer to brief therapy, but uh, there's there are other options. And so when people don't have um, much time and can avail themselves of multiple session kind of program, there are ways um, to still uh, apply the expert model. I'll talk about how you could take some sections of Teen Intervene if you only had a few minutes. Um, it's published by Hazelden Press. There's the website um, for accessing the fourth edition. Um, so there's a manual with on the jump drive workshops, uh, worksheets, questionnaires, and handouts, and they're, they're available for unlimited printing. Um, many clinics and sites have one manual and they share it. Um, good news for everyone, the California Department of Education, as part of the California Healthy Kids Resources Center, is providing uh, available on loan um, access to Teen Intervene. More information about that um, Amy can um, discuss later. And in the chat box, I think they're going to provide you with a link so you can get more information about uh, free access um, to this resource. We tried to develop this to have a lot of user-friendly features. So for service providers, the manual is very detailed. It provides you with guidance of how you can adjust it. There's many ways you want to adjust any intervention. Um, even though this is manualized, we encourage people to, to make um, smart and strategic um, adaptations along the way. I think this is an easy program to learn. You, you don't have to go through formal training, but um, because the manual is very detailed. Um, although some people like formal training and those are options if, if you're so interested, I can talk about it later. Um, but it has to be user-friendly for the teenager. So um, it's client-centered. Um, you act as a negotiator in many ways with a young person as opposed to dictating certain things. Um, it's not a heavy commitment. It's a low level commitment. Um, you're, you're hoping to get the teenager to join you for at least two sessions, um, even though it's a three session program, because um, the third is for the parent. Um, so that's not, not heavy lift in many ways. Um, and there's a lot of activity. So um, you're able to engage the young person in, in discussing things with you and working on worksheets, questionnaires, um, and responding to all kinds of, of activities. So it's organized around three models, stage of change model, motivational interviewing, and CBT. 
If you read the manual, it goes into great depths about these building blocks for Teen Intervene. I think all of you are familiar with these uh, three components. I just wanna emphasize um, motivational interviewing is very user-friendly for young people in the suggested script, uh, capitalize on that. Um, in other words, it stays away from closed questions. It does a lot of affirmations and encourages reflective listening. As a sidebar, reflective listening is a very effective um, therapy clinical technique. So even if you're not sure what to say to a person or how to move uh, the ball forward in a counseling session, if you just do reflective listening, that often is uh, quite, quite uh, valuable and effective. And it really helps the, uh, the other person realize that you're listening. Um, it provides some pause. So either you or they can, can um, add more insights to the conversation. CBT is a big feature because we want users of it to learn some skills. So we, uh, we organize a lot of the skill building features around cognitive behavior therapy principles. Goals are specific. Um, we, uh, we provide insights. We um, have activities that allow the young person and you to practice, et cetera. Now, the one feature that we'll talk about is how you want to establish goals with a young person. The manual encourages abstinence, but it realizes that might not be a realistic goal or at least a realistic short-term goal. So there are instructions about how to at least encourage some type of harm or risk reduction. Um, I recommend when people use it that they still talk about abstinence with a teenager and see how they think about it, what it might take, just so that um, that kind of conversation and that kind of mindset is put in place. But we're realistic. Sometimes it's, there's just not enough um, option to be, go down an abstinence route. Okay. It's a program intended for this middle part of my uh, sideways triangle. So within the, the target settings box, I've got some examples and for schools uh, is a setting of uh, uh, primary interest for Teen Intervene. And the idea is that it's uh, addressing young people who have um, a mild, moderate problem or a very early problem, or if you were to use a substance use disorder category, it would be the mild, moderate version. It could be used for those in intensive treatment. You could. You could, um, uh, as a menu-driven type thinking, just use some of the activities at various parts of your uh, work with a young person. Some of them are great for groups, so you could um, apply them as a, a group activity. But we'd always hope that um, a lot of young people are, are starting to use substances. Um, it would be great if there can be early intervention, and many of those young people are seen in schools, courts, pediatric clinics, emergency rooms, and mental health clinics. So um, it could be a standalone in those settings as well as uh, something to supplement. With the help of a colleague in New York, uh, this is a flow chart of how they use it in their school setting. I thought this was interesting um, because they had really two paths um, and it depended on whether the student had been caught with a substance or paraphernalia for the first time or not the first time. So if it was the first infraction, you can see down the yes path, depending on what substance was the issue, the, the, uh, the student got uh, an education-based um, response or resource. But if it was more than the first response then uh, or incident, then um, next up for the teen was applying teen intervene. And so this might be, a model that you could think about and we can discuss later, but I liked it because they realized that perhaps a first incident that might be quite mild and not suggesting a lot of consequences um, merit um, um, not a heavy handed intervention, but are more um, aligned with education based um, response for the team. But a second strike <laughs> um, led to more intensive response. So I've mentioned ways in which the program can be used, but now there are some cautions. So um, for severe end cases, so someone with a, uh, a severe version of a substance use disorder or is already showing early signs of addiction, this is not a standalone prog program that you would want to just assume is going to be effective enough. Um, it surely could be used as the front end 
um, of a program uh, where you're going to continue services later on uh, to get the momentum of change going, you could use it at the front end, but not as a, a single standalone where you think this could be sufficient for those severe end cases. Um, most teenagers that have a substance use issue have other co-occurring or coexisting issues or problems and supplemental treatment is warranted in many of those instances. And then as I mentioned, while brief interventions as well as teen intervene talks about non-abstinence goals that might not be suitable for some of us. So based on your setting, your clinical orientation, what you're comfortable with, you may have to just stick with abstinence goals. Um, that may mean um, putting aside um, negotiating how you could reduce risk and reduce harm, but um, just right on going with the discussion with a teenager that we got to talk about how you're going to have to halt use because this is um, what's indicated because the perhaps the judge is going to come down on you if you test positive with a follow-up or your use is such or where I work. We only work and deal with um, abstinence type goals. It is, you know, a sticky wicket to talk about non-absence goals when we're dealing with minors because their use is, is um, technically illegal. Um, and of course, um, early uses at any level can be harmful for uh, the developing teenager. Um, so it's, it's always something you wanna think about when you use a program like Teen Intervene, where you wanna um, place your mark with, with goals when you are dealing with the young person. So that's my big picture overview um, and some context. So the next part is I'm gonna review what's in the fourth edition um, and walk you through uh, some of the components, show you a little bit, some show and tell. Um, so the fourth edition has two, two main core contents. Um, there's a three session module that addresses substance use and is very similar to the third edition with some minor changes. And then it added um, a new component or module, which is three sessions that just focuses on nicotine use, including vaping. All of the modules um, have a lot of features that I wanna emphasize. I hope they're viewed as user-friendly. Um, there's always uh, an overview, usually one or one and a half pages of each session of what um, is the goals of the session, what materials are needed, how long the session takes. There um, are instructions for how to administer each activity, very detailed instructions. Uh, the manual um, has a lot of suggested scripts. So um, if you follow the manual, um, you, you really can capitalize on you're going to be implementing motivational interviewing, you're going to be using cognitive behavior therapy techniques, and you will also be sensitive to stage of change. And it's helpful if you're new to working with young people um, in this kind of setting to have that kind of safety net. For those that are very experienced, it's probably a bit of an overkill, but um, at least you can see how uh, we view uh, the ways to unfold all the activities and to progress uh, along the way with each session and how to start and, and, and conclude a session. Um, worksheets, questionnaires, all the printed type materials are, are um, on a jump drive. And as I mentioned, they can be um, copied um, uh, as much as you need. And then any of the parent or family materials that require um, a handout or reading are in a in Spanish version. The manual is not in a Spanish version, but some of the um, worksheets questionnaires needed for the parents are in Spanish. Okay, next up, a little bit more. There's uh, some ancillary content in, uh, in the program. So there's several appendices. You can see there a lot of background material. The frequently asked questions section is a chance for you to see what are some of the answers that users of Teen Intervene have given when they're um, challenged with, with various um, uh, variations of how to use it. What happens if the teen doesn't want the parent to get involved? Um, 
what, what if I can't do uh, the administration as suggested? You know, that is too much time has passed in between sessions, those kinds of things. And then a reminder, there's a lot on the uh, jump drive. In addition to all the core content that's part of the manual, um, there's a, a brief overview of, of teen brain development and how it's, it's important to try to be drug-free during the teen years. Um, Drug-specific information uh, section provides one or two pages of info about uh, the, the major drug categories and then a separate resource on vaping. So those first three are the kind of thing that you could print out and give to the teen, the parent, or both. And then for those therapists who are interested in some self-evaluation, there's a, a rating form that you fill out, or you could have supervisor fill out if somebody were sitting in or listening. Um, and that is a way to give you a guidance as to whether you've implemented the program with fidelity. It's very straightforward, you know, did I do this activity? Did I do that activity? It's basically a checklist, but something you could use or as, uh, as administrator of it or as a supervisor. So the next few minutes, I'm gonna focus on the two big modules. So remember there's two of them, teen, what's called teen intervene module. That's the one focusing on uh, substance use in general. And then the nicotine model, which is module, which is focused on nicotine. So first up, this module, um, its content runs from a screening tool. I'll get to that in a moment. And then teen session one, teen session two, and the family session, which is the third. Um, it is mostly the parent, but we'll talk about why it's called a family session. And that includes the RT part of the expert model, the referral to treatment, because that's a chance for you and um, all involved to discuss what might be next. So there is an administration plan that's relatively ideal, starting with the first session, um, which would include either having already done the screening or you start that first session with the screening. And then seven to 10 days later, the second session with a teenager. And then in about seven to 10 days after that, the third session, which is the parent only, but it's desirable to conclude that third session with the teen joining you and the parent for closure discussion and a way to communicate what plans might be for next steps, the RT part of the model. So if you play this out, it's roughly you know, a three to four week program. Now session one though has a quirk to it that I'll mention coming up. A reminder about the uh, screening. Um, so a screening tool is provided. Um, it has three components. There's um, a drug use history component, um, and it asks uh, about alcohol and other drug use during the prior 12 months. And it has a checklist for some detail about other drug use other than alcohol. And then there's the six item craft. Many of you might know about the craft. Um, the Acronym C-R-A-F-F-T stands for keywords in those six items, and then a nicotine use questionnaire. Some more details for you on this. There's the, whoops, too fast. There's the craft, the six items. Each of the key letters in the acronym stands for the first letter of a key word. And, and we recommend that out of six possible yeses, a zero to one probably means that the in, there's no teen intervene indicated, but the sweet spot for teen intervene would be somewhere in the two to five range that is out of six. And then with six, there are several options. Um, now you might have a severe case, but you still could forge ahead with the, the intervention and then in the referral to treatment component, um, make some decisions about additional services that are needed. Um, or you could, as some do, they realize um, we could go right to referral to treatment, referral for more services or more treatment. Then maybe you have a warm handoff option, you have a local community option where you realize, okay, I might have more in a severe problem here than um, I wanna handle or that my caseload can accommodate. And so I, I might go directly to uh, a referral elsewhere. Here's the nicotine use questionnaire and 
Hang on a second. I think a red box is going to show up with my next hit. There you go. Yeah. So you can see the questionnaire has questions about smoking, um, when you started to use use of other nicotine products. And then in detail here, uh, 3A, B, and C really get the, the three types, major types of, of um, nicotine use. And then it asks about frequency. Um, in the past 12 months. Our recommendation is if, if a teenager for any of these nicotine products says about weekly or about daily, that would indicate they might need the nicotine module. Obviously you could use it for anyone. Uh, maybe there was just a vaping incident in school and the rule is, okay, you know, it's a vaping incident, you get uh, this program. You might not have someone who says they use that frequently. Um, but um, for those that want to at least get an what was the opinion of the authors of the program where they might place um, uh, and claim indication of teen intervene for nicotine use? This is where I have uh, have made it, made my case. But um, of course, clinical judgment um, is important with that. So teen session one has two parts because we realize it's there's a lot of content and it can be difficult, particularly in school setting where you don't have more than maybe even 40 minutes. So it's broken into two parts. So that's why you're going to see part one here. And uh, the basic components are an introduction and then a discussion of the teen screen that I already showed you what, what's in that with the cage. I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the craft. And then there's a teen questionnaire, which asks the teenager about their um, attitude about how much they use, whether they think it's a problem, and if they might be interested in, in change. And then um, a pros and cons exercise, the standard uh, decisional balance, and then the a triggers and cravings. So that's a lot, and it's in, believed to take from 40 to 50 minutes. I'm not going to show you the details of all of these, but I am going to show you one of the more, I think, interesting ones in this part one, and that's the triggers and cravings exercise um, from the manual. This exercise activity is introduced in the following way. Change isn't easy and cravings to use alcohol or other drugs are a normal part of the change process. This exercise will help show you how triggers or cravings to use come about. And then you review uh, this list and you verbalize these various triggers and you ask the teenager to comment whether that is applies to them or not. And then after you and you circle the ones that they they say are relevant. After you review the list, then you you follow up with which ones feel like the most common reason or reasons. Um, and then please describe a recent situation where you experienced this trigger. So you get an opportunity to engage and discuss. So it's more than just assessing triggers. You you want the teenager um, to do some processing with you. Information that you file away and you use later when you're establishing goals. So session one has a second part and the hope is that you can do it the next day. So we're imagining, okay, you don't have enough time to do both parts. That's a lot of minutes, maybe more than 60. So you're gonna break in two parts, but you don't want too much time to, to, uh, to pass to finish uh, that session. It, involves um, the ready to change exercise and then a nice lengthy, hopefully, discussion about establishing goals. And then an opportunity to give the teenager a handout, a handout titled Advantages of Not Using Alcohol and Other Drugs. You uh, perhaps can appreciate ready to change notion is complicated, but it turns out um, a ruler uh, scale like this works very well. So the uh, manual guides you on how to introduce this. And the idea is the teenager is rating on a one to 10 scale, how ready they feel right now for some change. You're not even asking for a specific change or how much change, just a general readiness. And then you follow up with these questions and it's multiple choice. So you read the four all the way from, I don't want to quit or cut down at this time to I have already stopped using alcohol and other drugs and you have them circle. Um, they're two parallel, but the key is this one to 10 rating. And the manual guides you on how to follow up discussions based on whether they give you a, a one or a two or whether they give you a relatively high number. 
then the um, program moves you into setting goals. So um, this is a chance for you to take all the information you have received in, in the two parts of session one, and you've really gotten a lot of information about how much interest they have in change or not, uh, what might be driving their substance use. There's a lot of social or psychological or coping features, and that can come about from the pros and cons exercise and the triggers and cravings activity. Um, you've got a, a, a number uh, on a scale of one to 10 of, of their readiness to change. And so the manual um, guides you to open up the discussion with the teenager about what kind of change might they be comfortable? Do they think there's some, some things they could, could do to reduce or stop their use? And so, and the manual gives you some guidance about if you go down a discussion of abstinence, here are some of the things you'd wanna um, elaborate on. Um, what are some of the risk harm reduction options? That, um, you, if the teenager doesn't have any, we got a long list of things. Um, you might have a teenager who doesn't want to make any changes. So the idea is to still have a homework assignment. And that would be to ask the teen to monitor their use on some variable. So monitor something like uh, keep track in the next week of, of how many days in that week you, you get high at least once, you know, something like that. The idea is you pick something that they probably do a lot of in the hopes that that's insight later when you discuss with them how often that occurs and maybe the teen has a, uh, an awakening moment and realizes they perhaps do something a lot and maybe need to pull back. And then the manual encourages you to include other health-related goals. It might just be adding assets in their life, reducing risk, doing something um, with their free time that is uh, healthier than, than um, getting high those kinds of things. They're, those are all pro-health goals, and maybe they'll have a nice secondary effect on reducing substance use, but they also might be more accommodating to a teenager if they don't wanna work on the substance use goals. Session two moves things along by having a chance to evaluate how things went in the interim, and then uh, adding to their teen coping toolbox, three skills, how to deal with peer pressure, how to enhance decision-making skills, and how to improve the use of social supports as they try to get healthy. Um, so you already know what the Ready to Change looks like. Um, it's, it's a repeat of the prior one, and you get a chance to compare scores and, and discuss how things hopefully got better, and you, you reward that. If things slipped, you discuss what might have been going on, and you do some troubleshooting. Dealing with peer pressure um, provides some um, specific ways teens have found uh, value and helpful when they uh, want to tell their friends maybe they don't want to use right now or they want to pull back on use in social situations or so-called peer pressured situations. So a chance for you to give some ideas to the teenager and they reflect on whether those might work or not. Enhancing decision-making skills is an effort to see if the teen can do better at um, pausing and reflecting and not acting impulsively. And then social support activity is expanding a discussion with the teenager about who around them might be supportive um, with, with their life, with hopefully goals of getting healthier and, and reducing halting use, and how could they uh, even build a larger social support network. I'm going to show you just one activity page. This is from the decision-making skills activity, and um, there's discussion in there and instructions to tell the teenager how this act this kind of skill of decision-making can be similar to a stoplight with various colors. And, and then this is a, a handout that you print, hopefully on color printer, and you, you give this as a card to the teen as a reminder of how um, they can use this five-step plan if they're faced with a tough decision and they wanna maybe not act impulsively, but wanna stop. Think about some options, choose an option among those that they've thought about, and then, and then act on that option. And with these steps, a teenager might find that they're making smarter decisions and um, trying to get away from the habit of, of, of rushed decisions where that teen brain uh, perhaps takes over too much. Okay, then there's the family session. Um, it can vary in time based on uh, how much 
uh, the parent or guardian or significant adult in the teen's life is interested in talking about issues, it has a lot. They're, they are all guided by worksheets and questionnaires. Um, so you don't have to be a family therapist uh, to implement this. The goal is to move the home life and the parenting practices to this wonderful little cell here where there's a lot of positive support and the disciplining practices are 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 what are called the effective ones, the favorable ones. That is, what's good favorable discipline? Well, there's consistent rules, not draconian consequences. Um, there's discussion uh, when things go bad. There's adjustment of rules when a teenager can, um, you know, can earn more privileges, etc. So a lot of the the family session is really improving uh, parenting practices. Um, here's just one um, profile. Exercise five in it is uh, talks about family rules, and so the the manual provides you with with suggested script on how to introduce this as a way to discuss family rules on alcohol and other drug use. You see if the the parent is willing to talk about ways they can agree on on a plan. Hopefully, it's a drug free expectation, but maybe not. But whatever is a plan that is healthier is something you uh, you strive to get the uh, parent to agree to, and and then some discussion is provided into, and um, suggestions about how the parent can set up rules and maybe even come up with a home plan. So the manual has a lot of details on how to roll this out with worksheets. And then there's the wonderful referral to treatment option. And um, a complicated part of the expert model. Um, here's some questions that are are uh, worth considering in, in the manual guide you with, with some of these answers. Um, do you have some internal service options or a warm handoff option um, for additional assessment or additional um, treatment services? What's in the community that's realistic? You can't refer families to a, a community-based service that's not realistic. And then there's the option of you could con you could conduct a booster session, meaning you are a, um, an answer to the referral to treatment option. Uh, the manual discusses how you could apply uh, an elaboration of the second session with the team and grow on that um, as the basis for a booster session. Now, it could be booster sessions also. All of this would depend on your comfort level, caseload issues, um, et cetera. But, um, Anecdotally, we found a lot of teenagers um, enjoyed the two sessions with our therapist, and they actually weren't happy that it had to end. We were doing a research protocol, so we had to put a put a stop to the uh, um, to the counseling because it was time to evaluate. Um, but we had we had many instances where young people were really feeling like they got a some nice momentum and started to establish a good rapport with the with the counselor and wanted to continue. Okay, I've got a few minutes just to give you an overview of the, the other core module, the teen nicotine module. It is pretty similar to the regular teen intervene module, um, but with some um, nicotine focus. Um, a reminder, uh, while teen intervene is evidence informed, um, I'm sorry, evidence-based, because we it went through um, randomized controlled trials. The teen nicotine module is what I'm going to refer to as evidence informed. So it uses components and features and elements that have been tested elsewhere and stitched together in a unique program that in and of itself hasn't been tested. Um, it's very hard to get funds these days to do this kind of testing. And it was an interesting conversation I had with the publisher. Are you sure you want to go forward with this? We're not going to be able to claim it's evidence-based in the same way um, the other program is, but um, they felt that the the, um, the request for nicotine-related services and intervention services was so high that um, they, they wanted me to go forward with it. So with humility, I present to you the, this teen nicotine module. It has um, similar structure. Um, two sessions for the team um, and one parent session. The All three sessions parallel a lot of the content from the regular program, but there are specific 
specific activities just addressing nicotine and vaping. Um, administration guidance is the same, you know, so you have seven to 10 days in between sessions. And with that third session, uh, good to have the team show up at the end where you uh, do some closure with everyone present. Um, so team session one also has part one and part two component given time considerations. Um, and nicotine questionnaire is paralleling the, uh, the regular teen intervene questionnaire. Pros and cons, triggers and cravings also quite similar, although the triggers and cravings, we adapted that to and looked at the literature about some of the cravings that are more relevant to nicotine use than other substances. It turns out there's a few specific ones, so they are incorporated. Um, part two uh, delves a little bit more into uh, the nicotine issue and has a, um, a vaping specific exercise, which I'm going to show you next, knowing that um, we figured a lot of uh, this content of Teen Intervene would be addressing the vaping phenomenon of young people, since that's so more popular these days than smoking cigarettes. I'm probably preaching to the choir in, in that um, cigarettes are are very infrequently used these days, but when a teen wants a nicotine hit, they're going to vaping. Um, but ready to change and establishing goals very similar to what's in the uh, prior session. So let me just show you the, the vaping attitudes exercise. It has a, a, the one, a one to 10 scale, kind of like the ready to change, but it, it leads off with, with this suggested script. I'm not gonna read all of it to you, but it basically, ask the teenager to hear you talk about how vaping maybe isn't so safe. Um, it might be safer than smoking cigarettes to some degree, but it is still harmful to your lungs. Vaping is similar to inhaling, inhaling an, art, an aerosol. Doing this damage to the linings of your lungs is not good. It can lead to asthma and other lung problems. And there's more elaboration here. So then the activity asks the teen, oh, what do you, whoops, sorry ask the team, what do they think about that? And they're asked to rate on the one to 10, um, how harmful do they think vaping is? Uh, session two, um, another specific focus on vaping, I'll show you in a minute. And then ready to change, that sounds familiar. You're, you're repeating that. You've got um, these three exercises or so-called skill building activities that were done earlier. And now it's more tweaked to, uh, to nicotine use. So it's peer pressure skills, how to enhance decision-making and how to reinforce social supports. But I'll show you the, the uh, activity about another look at vaping. It gets more, again, at the attitudes. And so um, it starts with, we talked about vaping during our last session. Let's return to this topic. I will read some statements about vaping nicotine and you tell me if you agree or disagree. And then you circle the response. And so there's five kind of the general stuff. It's bad habit, bad for my breath, et cetera. But the idea is you follow up each of those based on whether there was an agree or disagree. So instructions below tell you how, oh, I'm going to affirm the agree um, and say things like, I see you see vaping can lead to health problems. It's good that your answer suggests that there's a downside. And then if they disagreed, which means they don't really maybe um, have a belief that it's all that harmful, you uh, things like, what would it take for you to agree with that statement? Some youth agree with this statement. Why do you think that is so? so hopefully engage in some pushback uh, about those attitudes and see if um, they can hear themselves talk about, well, maybe I'm um, not really um, having the correct attitude about, about vaping and maybe there is a, an unsafe side to it that I haven't thought much about or surely haven't talked much about. As you can imagine, if you are doing a nicotine uh, sessions with a teenager and there is no vaping involved, you just skip those sessions. Although maybe some of you have thought of this, you know, I could perhaps use, whoops, perhaps I could use this exercise as a way to prevent future vaping. So as the manual suggests, you know, even though it might be irrelevant to current behavior, you could you could get into the mindset of the teen. So what do you think about vaping? I, I know you're not vaping, but some teens have. So what do you think about? Can vaping be bad for, is vaping this, vaping that, as a preventative? Okay, so then there's the family session. 
and this has, um, whoops, sorry, a little quick there on the draw. Um, also can be lengthy. It has um, detailed activities and the labels there are should look familiar. Questionnaire, worksheet, six steps, family rules, family goals. Ooh, oh wait, there's a new one. Teen triggers and cravings. That is not part of the uh, the other family session. So we added this, thinking that you know there's a lot of triggers for nicotine use in the home because a lot of parents might be using. So this is very relevant um, when you have parents um, that have nicotine products in the home, whether they're vaping or cigarette smoking or pipe smoking or whatever. And so this uh, follows the same format where you you um, ask the parents if these things could be possible triggers in the home. And of course, the manual suggests that you follow up with, hey, what is some things you could do at home so to reduce or eliminate these potential triggers? So things like um, there's cigarette or vape pen in the home, smoking or vaping is allowed in the home, someone in the home acts, asks the teenager for a cigarette or another nicotine product, things like that. Um, if there's no nicotine use in the home and you already know that it's uh, verboten, you know, you, you wouldn't do this exercise. But, um, you know, triggers are so powerful and they really can be uh, pernicious when it comes to nicotine use. And the home, unfortunately, can be a, a source of that. Okay, to summarize, and I'm going to turn it over to the fun speakers, Jessica and Marina. Um, Teen Intervene is an expert-based resource. It's, it's at the large end or the um, more heavy lift end uh, on the expert continuum. Its uh, sweet spot is the mild, moderate substance using adolescents. It does include a parent slash family component, which is um, separate, which makes it somewhat distinct from other expert programs. And we hope it has many friendly features for you and for those who you're um, applying it to. Contact name and info for you um, repeated. So thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'm going to hang around, of course, because there might be some Q&A afterwards. And over to Jessica. Um, before I pass it to Jessica, real quickly, Ken, I just wanted to have you respond to one of the questions that's come up in the chat a couple of times, which is what type of training is needed to implement this program or is following the manual sufficient? So I don't think an experienced counselor would need formal training to really be good at it. I think the manual is very detailed. So if you weren't experienced and you studied the manual and you practiced with the manual where you could imagine you know, role playing with someone um, or practicing and imagining that there's a teenager and you're just um, going through all the exercises and, and working with the, the suggested script, all of that, you also, I think, could elevate your skill. Um, some people enjoy trainings because it kickstarts their learning, even though they're going to need to do more after a, a formal training. Typical trainings are one day. Um, I've done two day where people really want to go into depth about motivational interviewing skills, but I assume with one day trainings, uh, people have that skill base. And so we skip that, that section pretty fast and we go right to, okay, how's this all gonna work when you apply teen intervene? Great, thank you. And one question that just popped in about uh, the suggested age range for teen intervene use. So it's targeted because of the research in with 12 to 17 year olds. So that's where the research base comes from. So younger and older, it surely could be applicable. Imagine an 11 year old who is already, you know, quite advanced for their age and getting into the behaviors you might see in a 15 year old, it, it could apply. Someone older, it could apply um, also. Uh, it, when someone isn't living at home and their peer group is very different than a high school peer group, well, then the program isn't as relevant. Then the other caveat, on all of this is, can they understand, you know, the uh, the sixth grade? No, sorry, fourth grade reading level. Um, although you can always read things to a teenager instead of having them fill something out. Great, thank you so much, Ken. And I will. We will have a little time for Q and A at the end if there's more questions that Ken can respond to. But I want to pass it over to Jessica Dyer. Um, thank you so much.
Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Ken. It was very thorough. Um, so I'm Jessica, and I actually implemented Teen Intervene um, years ago. In we there was a grant that we got at Native American Health Center to implement it in our school-based um, health centers, and um, we used the expert model, as Ken uh, mentioned. And so the way we implemented it was uh, in, for the medical visits, students would complete. Uh, the craft um, screener, and then students that were identified as having a positive score um, within that mild to moderate uh, range, they would be referred to um, our behavioral health, so, so me, um, in the clinic. In our other clinics where we did not have behavioral health providers, um, our health educators were the ones who were implementing uh, Teen Intervene. So they would get referred to one of us to uh, implement. And then if I'll talk about what we did when um, there was a, a, a more severe need um, later on, um, but that seemed to work really well to have students fill out the craft screener when they were coming into the clinic um, to identify anybody um, that was having a need. And students would come in for medical visits, um, the cost team could refer them uh, if there was a they had been found using on campus, they could refer them to the clinic specifically for that. Um, so we were able to get a number of students um, to come in to take the craft screening and then get referred to treatment. If there were, if they scored a zero to one, the medical provider would provide um, just a brief MI intervention. We had all of our staff um, in the clinic trained on motivational interviewing um, so that we were all coming from the same perspective. Um, so they would come into the clinic, get the craft screening, zero to one, they just have a little talk with the provider. If there was um, a more uh, need indicated, they would get a referral to Teen Intervene. And then if there was a more severe treatment, we would make a, a different referral. So I um, really appreciate the way Teen Intervene really elicits the student's motivation, uh, right? It is. I think a foundation and motivational interviewing is so important. Um, but I found the intervention to be so respectful of where the student was at um, and really coming from the perspective of we're really helping the student elicit their own reflection of their life to be able to make choices and move forward in their life in a way that was really meaningful to them. Um, I've done some training of of other people to go on and implement teen intervene and one thing that i think it can we can get caught up in as adults when we're working with youth is sometimes trying to impart all this education and particularly with the um, impacts that drug and alcohol use can have on teens right it's coming from a loving place of wanting to educate and let them know how impactful this can be but if we're coming from a place of just top down and educating and just letting them know the risks, the students are likely not going to be very motivated to actually um, change their behavior. So what I really love about Teen Intervene is that we're really looking at getting from the student what is going on in their life and helping them reflect on what's working well, what's not working well, how is their substance use actually impacting them. A lot of times what I found is students didn't really have a self-reflection around that. Maybe they had some sort of general idea like, oh yeah, you're not really supposed to use, but I'm doing it because my peer group is doing it, or they find that they're getting benefits from it. It's helping them feel like they can just kind of space out, tune out, relax when things are overwhelming. And so they're finding a benefit from it. Um, they think they're finding a benefit from it. But when we really dive in and help them start to reflect on what is it that they're wanting in their life? What are their larger goals? What are they hoping um, to be achieving? And then helping them break down, looking at how is their substance use actually impacting that? They begin to be able to be like, oh, wait a second. You know, I have this goal of, you know, one of the students, I she had a goal of attending college and there were some really meaningful reasons for her that she really wanted to do that. And then we were looking at when she was using um, and she 
the hell, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, and she uh, could see that when she, she was using during school and the class that she would use beforehand, she was not doing well in. Um, and before we did the intervention of her actually doing some more self-reflection and looking at what was going on, she just kind of didn't like that teacher, assumed that she just wasn't really good at that subject. Um, and when she reduced using, when she stopped using before that class, she, what she found is that she was actually able to pay attention. And so we were able to bring her awareness to the fact that her use was impacting what she wanted in her life. And for her to reduce the use was actually helping her get towards where she wanted. Um, and so Teen Intervene, the manual is so detailed and so uh, it just walks you through the process of really taking students through this, this um, process of developing their own reflection of what they want and how the use is impacting their life. Um, one of the worksheets that I really like is the pros and cons of use, but then also the pros and cons of not using. And so it's really being honest with, yeah, if you stop using, there could be things that are really hard about that. And so instead of ignoring that or pretending that that's not the case, Let's look at that. Let's really talk about what would be hard about stopping to use. For many students, I find that the social aspect is what gets really hard. Um, and so then really helping them. OK, so that's a reality. If you stop using, then there are going to be friends who say something. There might be friends who actually don't want to hang out with you anymore. And for a student, that's a really big deal. I mean, if we're honest, you know, even as adults, that can be challenging when maybe you're not drinking and then you're like, oh, but all my friends are going to go out for happy hour. And am I going to be the odd one out? Right. I just say that, that we can have some empathy, that the social aspect is real. And so helping students really develop what strategies of hanging out with other friends, of finding ways that they can um, fill their, their time with other activities. I know one student um a really big trigger for her was when she got to school the way she walked to her class she walked by her friend group who they all had their spot that they were smoking marijuana and she found it too hard to walk by them and not engage in the use so one of our goals that she that she came up with was she charted a different map she literally was like all right i cannot walk this way to school anymore or to my class anymore when I get to school. So she developed a different way that she walked um, to her classroom so that she could avoid that trigger because it was too, if she were to be around them, it would not, um, she would have too hard of a time saying no. Um, and the other thing I love about Teen Intervene is the way that the goals can really be what is going to be best for the student. And it's so, it's an open door for the student. So one student, um, you know, she was using a lot and she really was not willing to not use, to stop use out completely. But what she found is that she really wanted to be able to be more focused when she was in school. So her goal was to reduce, to not use while she was at school. And she was able to do that. Um, I had one student that when we started the, we started the teen intervene and she was like, absolutely not. I, you know, I don't want to change anything. And one of the goals that if a student doesn't want to change anything, one of the goals I really like to implement is just having them journal. Journal on when are they using? How are they feeling before they're using? What's going on that's triggering they're using? How do they feel after they're using? What do they notice in their life? So really the goal is just increasing their own self-awareness of why they're using, what choices they're making so that they can start developing a larger bandwidth for making choices that they're actually going to be benefiting them. Um, so that was, we went through the whole series. That was all she would commit to. And then it was about a month later, she came back because she wanted a job. And this job required that she um, would take P tests. And so she wouldn't be able to use marijuana. So she was like, okay, my life circumstances have changed and I want to stop using. Can we go through this again? And so we did. Um, and, you know, I didn't, there was never any shame around when she first didn't want to stop her use, it was just an open door, respecting this is where you're at right now. This is your decision. Um, I'm here if you do change your mind. And she was able to come back. Um, 
and, and make some different choices. So I really just appreciate how much Teen Intervene really respects students and where they're at in their process. Um, yeah, and the increase in self-awareness. Um, so I just wanted to touch on also that Teen Intervene can be a group intervention. So we, at one point, you know, I was the only behavioral health clinician that we had in that clinic, and we were starting to get quite a bit of referrals for Teen Intervene, and I didn't really know how I was going to meet all of the need and my caseload. Um, and so we decided to try out a group. I decided to let's, let's do a group with this. And it was so successful. Um, you know, I think, again, going back to that developmentally, teens are supposed to be social at that point, right? Their peer group is so important to them. And so to be able to be in a group of students where we're talking about these things, where we're talking about the impacts um, and the negative impacts of substance use and brainstorming, problem solving ways that they can actually make different choices and support one another was really powerful. I will always remember we were going through the triggers and cravings worksheets and problem solving. Okay, when you get this trigger and like, um, what are some ways you can move around uh, to avoid actually using? And one of the things is like text a friend and students were like, well, most of my friends are using. Uh, and so they all whipped out their phones and they exchanged cell phone numbers and they made a pact that they would text each other when they were having these um, triggers. It was just you know, something that if it was just me and the student alone, I never would have been able to just create that support for them. But together, they were able to make that happen. Um, and I just took each of the the activities that we did uh, that you do in Teen Intervene. And I, we did it would do a group brainstorm um, at first, then we would have go back down into individual reflection, they would fill out their own worksheets, and then we would do a circle share of what they were um, committing to, uh, and what they were noticing in their own life. And it was really beautiful. Um, so if it's something you're curious about, I really recommend playing with, um, with the group because it was really effective and enjoyable. Um, and then with referral to treatment, when there's a more severe case, we were lucky enough at this time, there was a substance use treatment center that actually worked with adolescents. And so we really made a strong relationship with this center. We actually are um, program manager went and did a site visit at their facility. We had their one of their um, staff come and do a site visit at our facility. We made an agreement that we would um, support each other and to be able to have these this referral network. And it wasn't just um, some random agency that we referred students to, but we actually developed a relationship with them. And so that we that we found to be very effective and. I know that it's a challenge and that there aren't always substance use centers um, that treat adolescents available, but if there are any in your area, I highly recommend uh, making that personal connection um, because, you know, there are people doing the work and we're people doing the work. And when we're actually connected, um, it seems to be a much easier flow um, for students to be able to get connected. They know that we trust them. They know, right, the trust is there and then students are more likely to follow through. Um, with the referral when that happens. Um, and so that was something that we were um, able to do and find really, and found really helpful. Um, yeah. And that is my portion. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. I really appreciated all of those real life examples, both the individual and the group. That's really beautiful. Um, follow up to Ken's talk. I and mean, now we're going to pivot a little bit and talk about non punitive responses to substance use um, and introducing Marina again. So thank you and take it away, Marina. Hello, my name is Marina. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and Aya, and I'll be talking about youth substance use and school discipline uh, policies. And so, what I'm going to go to cover is why as school based providers, it's important to consider clinical practices in conjunction with school policies, what we know about youth substance use and educational outcomes, and how important it is to rethink school discipline policies and how you can advocate. So as school-based health providers, you have the skills, the training to respond to young people's health needs, and now 
You also have information on youth substance use. But we also know you're embedded in school systems, which at least historically and oftentimes have a response to youth substance use from a behavioral discipline and or a zero tolerance perspective. So that's what I want to add to today's conversation, how to move away from punitive discipline, zero tolerance using our public health approach to youth substance use. And quickly, I want to note that there are many organizations in California advancing alternatives to punitive school discipline policies. Many equity grassroots parent and youth organizations in California have been advancing this work at the state and local level. And while today I'm focusing specifically on discipline responses to student substance use, I do want to recognize that those responses really can be separate from an overall look at any discipline practices. So here's a little uh, look at what the research says about student substance use and why schools should care. So for academic outcomes, student substance use is linked to lower grades, student absenteeism, and higher rates of high school dropouts. And it's uncommon in California, an estimated 15% of ninth graders and 23% of 11th graders have used alcohol or drugs at least once in the last month, according to the California Healthy Kids Survey. And of course, we want to address student substance use, not punish it. And in terms of school connectedness, uh, we also found that schools can decrease the percentage of students that use alcohol or drugs. Not just any schools, but those that improve school climate for students. Students who feel more connected to are less likely to engage in risky behavior, such as violence, sexual health, and substance use, and more likely to engage in positive health behaviors, including physical activity and healthy eating. In the California Healthy Kids Survey, this is measured by school connectedness, which is a measure uh, based on student responses to five questions on the California Healthy Kids Survey about feeling safe, close to people, uh, feeling uh, being a part of the school, being happy at school, and about teachers treating students fairly. And as you can see in the graph, students with higher school connectedness, so those that feel safe and happy at the school, uh, the light blue column are less likely to have used alcohol or drugs in the past month. The inverse is true for students with low school connectedness. So for the light blue, you see that we have a 10%. A uh, for the medium one, we have a 17%, which is a red one. And then for the low one, the dark blue, we have almost 26%. So schools can address student substance use by ensuring their students feel connected to their school. And pushing students out of school for substance use infractions doesn't help um, and disproportionately pushes students of color out. In 2022, there were 3,200 drug-related suspensions, uh, making up about 20% of all suspensions. And over 60% of drug-related suspensions are boys, over 75% of socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and 59% are youth of color. A student who was suspended or expelled is twice as likely to repeat their grade and nearly three times as likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year. So not only do suspensions and expulsions increase the chances of incarceration, they make students feel shame, um, alienation, rejection, leading to higher instances of depression, substance abuse, and other negative mental health outcomes. And what is really interesting is that in addition to the negative health outcomes, there is no research to support that suspensions and expulsions are even effective at helping students learn or making school safer. Next. Um, Amy, could you help me? I've been trying to switch the slide, but it's stopped working. Oh, there we go. And then next thing, the California Ed Code. So the Education Code established parameters for the student behaviors that require suspension and expulsion, and behaviors that may result in a suspension or expulsion. We created a resource for our school health field to understand and dispel misconceptions about what our state law says about discipline responses for student substance use. The table provides an overview of the state laws that inform school response to student substance use. This code provides some discretion to school administrators when deciding an appropriate response. 
Um, if you see the yellow section, it enumerates the acts that students can be suspended or expelled for, but it does not require suspension or expulsion, except for the case below, uh, which is uh, the only infraction that requires suspension and expulsion is without any wiggle room, it's for selling a controlled substance. Um, and you can see some of the language in the top yellow area where it's a may versus a must, or unless an alternative means of correction would address the conduct, or suspension should be imposed only when other interventions fail. So some key takeaways from this is that California law doesn't require suspension or expulsion for many substance use infractions. And it does explicitly mention alternatives to suspension des designed to address the specific behavior. Lastly, we would argue that suspension or expulsion doesn't do much to address student substance use. So we advocate for leveraging school health providers as an alternative. And I wanna share quickly um, a little bit about what's going on in terms of legislation. So this year, there is a bill, AB 599. It is being led by Assembly uh, Member Ward, and it's focusing on tobacco use suspension, expulsion for policies. Um, it used to be substance use suspension, expulsion policies, but it, it was watered down a little bit um, to continue moving through the process. Uh, this bill removes having possessed or use tobacco or products containing tobacco or nicotine products from the list of acts for which a pupil, regardless of their grade of enrollment, may be suspended or recommended for exp expulsion for. This bill is being led by or co-sponsored by the California Alliance, Children Now, and the California Youth Empowerment Network. And what this bill does is really give school administrators and teachers more tools to address tobacco use in schools by requiring the California Department of Education to create a model for how to handle situations when students are found with tobacco on campus. It will also allow school faculty to develop a plan for students while collaborating with local stakeholders, such as community-based organizations, educational agencies, and treatment providers, giving schools the option to take a public health approach instead of a punitive one. And if you want uh, more language or more information about this bill, I can add um, more information into the chat. So instead of suspending or expelling students for substance using behaviors, which pushes students out of school away from protective factors and can further exacerbate substance use, schools can and should play a role in identifying, intervening, treating student substance use and supporting equity for all youth. By intentionally moving away from punitive discipline policies and instead linking students to services and resources that can address some of the underlying causes of substance use, school and school-based health partners can best address student substance use. Do these instead. So change school discipline policies, refer to school-based health centers or other health providers, provide mental health services, incorporate comprehensive substance use info in health education, and lastly, but most importantly, engage students. Use existing peer health educators or a youth advisory board or bring together a leadership group of youth to authentically hear their ideas about how to address substance use on campus. It is one thing to hear um, information coming from adults, uh, and it is a very different thing to hear this information from peers. Um, I think it makes such a larger impact on young people to hear information from people who are their age and are, are facing similar things. And I do want to share a case study of how this could look. So at San Fernando High School, this happened a few years ago. San Fernando High School is a school within the Los Angeles Unified School District. Their students with an on-campus minor substance use violation could opt out to attend four sessions of substance use counseling in lieu of suspension. The counseling was provided by behavioral health clinicians at the school-based health uh, center run by Northeast Valley Health Center. And the referral process included a contract signed by the San Fernando High School Dean, the student and the parent or guardian. Uh, suspensions decreased by 64% during the first year of implementation. And just to wrap things up, the California state law is clear that other means of correction that addresses students' conduct should be implemented instead of suspension or expulsion. 
PNEDA school policies do not address the underlying issues contributing to substance use. The most effective approaches to helping youth reduce tobacco use are through counseling, restorative, and trauma-informed practices, peer mediation, and education. And lastly, school connectedness can have a positive impact on whether a student uses tobacco or other substances. Exclusionary discipline responses to decrease a student's um, so exclusionary discipline responses do decrease a student's school connectedness. And I can add a few links in terms of resources uh, where you can find a little bit more information um, and different examples and alternatives for uh, punitive discipline. And that is all for me. Thank you so much, Marina. Appreciate all of the wisdom that our three presenters have shared. We do have a little bit of time to have some questions and there's a couple that are in the chat already. Let me um, get both of our, all of our presenters back on screen and then we will address those. One that came up earlier in the chat was about um, the brief intervention program, EMT's brief intervention program. Does anyone have experience with both brief intervention and teen intervene? What are the significant similarities or differences? Ken, are you familiar with the model? No. Well, what's EMT? That might mean I'm not too familiar. Uh, I don't know if this person is still here, Linnell, if you want to um, let us know any more specifics to help answer that question. And Jessica, yeah. is it any, are you familiar with that model? I'll take a guess. A lot of models, they are sometimes called brief negotiated interviews, and they're usually, you know, somewhere between 20 to 60 minutes, and they usually um, open with a lot of uh, motivational interviewing, and then do pros and cons, and then goal setting. So that might be what's being referred to. It's, it's a common tool in a toolbox when all kinds of settings just don't have luxuries to implement multiple sessions. Pediatric clinics love that kind of model, for example. That might be. Yeah, it sounds like from the chat, it's a brief intervention program where it is two to three session interviews with students. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> there was a question. Um, we'll put some more information about how districts can access it at no cost. Um, and we will share contact information for our panelists as well as the slides. Um, I think there was a question. Um, Someone put in the chat, I work for a community health center that has a health hub at our local high schools. We are having trouble working with an administration that believes that resilience from reaching rock bottom is the best way for students to take on healthier lifestyles. How do you recommend ways to work with an administration that seems to have radically different ideas of supporting students? So basically wanting students to hit their rock bottom um, as that step to want to, to make change. Now there's a challenge for somebody's motivational interviewing skills, right? To try to convince somebody. I mean, it's, it's a pretty risky path or approach because, you know, going down to rock bottom can lead to a lot of terrible outcomes. It's not as if you go to rock bottom and you're just um, seeing it's feeling like it's getting worse, getting worse, getting worse, and then you all of a sudden have insight. I've got to get, I got to get someone to help me change. Going rock bottom can mean terrible things for a teen's outcomes. You know, including you know serious medical, physical, psychological damage. So it's it's a pretty risky path. Um, if if that was the only way young people changed, then, then we wouldn't do prevention or any early intervention program and the data would always show it doesn't work. 
because nobody nobody cares unless you hit rock bottom, but that isn't true. Um, how come we got data that showed brief intervention worked with teens? They weren't at rock bottom. They were in the mild moderate category. You know, if if he was right or that person or that philosophy was right, we wouldn't be getting the kind of numbers we get. So, I mean, the premise is wrong. Although, of course, how do you change somebody's premise that believes in it, even though it doesn't fit reality? That's very difficult. Um, hopefully there's other maybe peers to that administrator in other districts that see it differently that might, you know, be able to influence somebody uh, stuck with that. It might be hard for a line staff to turn that, turn around an administrator's points of view, but maybe someone else with um, that, that that administrator might see as a peer that it has more enlightened view. I also wonder if they're taking that approach also because they are strapped. They don't really know what to do. And so yeah. if you have a health hub that's serving the students, um, I mean, just seeing if they would just let you serve them before they get there. You know, it's not causing them any harm to let you try and right. see what happens. Right. And so understanding you both have the same goal and telling them you understand their goal. They want students to be healthy and well. That's what you want. And how showing that by students engaging in something like this, that they actually have more likelihood of staying in school, of attending school and letting you try, see if it works. Um, they're approach right. of just letting them reach rock bottom well they're not doing anything anyway so what's the harm in letting you try um and you Usually, know they might not be on board but at least you could be providing some services it's hard to imagine if you help somebody that you're going to encourage them to go further down rock bottom path so like you say <laughs> or maybe that's neutral effect but you got probably an upside mm -hmm. i can't imagine it makes it worse yeah now some schools or systems they just screen because they don't have the wherewithal luxury or the philosophy to want to engage in a, in a behavior change program, but then they have a plan for what to do with the screening information, you know, an informed public health plan. Sometimes that helps some systems realize, okay, we can, I call it dipping your toes. It's still taking the health and well-being of young people seriously. Yeah, I mean, I think the more you can find common ground, right? Because people have all kinds of radically different ideas about how you get somewhere, but the more you can find common ground with somebody and understand that you have a different way of getting there, but you both have the same goal and just letting each other be that it can actually be really effective. Um, and not, you know, coming down on them that they're wrong, but just you guys have different ways right. of seeing things. Right, thank you. Um, another question that had come in actually before the our um, start of our webinar today was about teen intervene. Um, would you consider teen intervene best as an early intervention or can it be used multiple times throughout care or treatment? It could be all those and even variations of the two posed in that question. So, you know, I'll just um, one simple way to think of it is as a as a um, three session program as a coherent unit that surely could be applied. Um, obviously, the sweet spot you know about. Um, but if you look at all the various activities, you could look at it as you're at a buffet, and some of these activities can make sense for various systems or. Um, um, elements along the path of, of teenagers getting care. So um, a, a group of teenagers in treatment for substance use, the council might realize, boy, peer dealing with peer pressures looks like a big issue for my, my group of clients. So, hey, there's this, I'll pull out the activity from Teen Intervene and we'll use that as a, as a group exercise. Um, some teens are, have a lot of, of uh, issues with uh, support system. So a counselor who's doing intensive treatment might realize, hey, I've got to try to go down this road and build that that um, that asset in the young person's life. Oh, well, how do I? Well, okay, yeah, there's some, you know, Teen Arena offers some guidance on how to do it. Obviously, you could, common sense could help too, but so all of them could 
could be like imagine as there are individual tools in a toolbox and you could pull it out any time, um, regardless of the uh, the intensity. And even with mental health, so you might be addressing teens with mental health. Often drug use is an issue. Uh, the pros and cons exercise is great because then the hopefully you get teen gets some insight about how they're overusing to address their emotional issues. Um, and that that is a bad path or the triggers and cravings. Okay, you know, this is often the emotional triggers and cravings are at play. So you don't have to, you wouldn't have to pull out the whole program, but you realize, hey, there's, I got to insert some uh, substance use um, uh, components because I'm trying to build a, a healthy picture for a client who came for depression or, or anxiety. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's asking about specific resources. Can you identify California or LA County specific resources for referral for teens with need for direct referral for treatment, especially low income families? I, I will say that since we're a statewide organization that serves the whole state, we're not often the best resource for specific programmatic you know, referrals at the local level, um, but we can certainly share any that we have after this call, um, but I don't know if any of our other folks on the call have any resource lists or, that are specific for referral. Yeah, so we'll we'll try to send out any links that we have. But again, since we are statewide, we're we're not often as as you know, programs do change quite a bit, and you know, eligibility. So I would certainly not want to share. Um, information that's not very relevant or up to date. Um, we are, I don't see any other questions. If I've missed something that we can discuss, you can drop it in the chat right now in our last moments. But I will just say that um, we're so appreciative of our panelists for this very lively, interesting discussion. We have um, a very super brief evaluation that will pop up when you log out. If you could just take a moment to complete that, we'd be really grateful. And you will be also receiving a follow-up email that has the slide deck, the recording, some of the referenced um, links so that you have what you need. And oh yes, and again, we're putting in that link so that if you're interested in having access to Teen Intervene at no cost, you'll be able to get that. So I'm not seeing any further questions. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day.